So uh, just to put a kind of a period on that moment, um, so many things have become political and we get into arguments over what should be done. I would just say, if you're struggling with giving to that, just read Matthew 25. And that's the parable of the sheep and the goats where Jesus said, I was in prison and you visited me. I, uh, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was hungry and you gave me some bread. Um, and he said, when you do it to the least of these, my brothers you, and sisters, you do it to me. I think that's our guidance. And that's what, how our response, I think, should be. But I would just say to you, if, you've, if you're not good with it, just don't give to it. Just don't do it. But if God moves in your heart and you want to bless some people and help some people, um, I would think it is a great thing to do. So we're going to have a little quiz this morning. We're going to see how, what your level of biblical literacy is for just a minute. And so the, the game we're going to play is this. I'll call it a game instead of a quiz. It sounds like more fun then, right? Um, so the game is in the Bible, not in the Bible, all right? Now, the first, phrase, the, the first phrase I'm going to use is one that I saw every day of my life growing up because it was on the wall in our dining room. And it said this, God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> no, that's not in the Bible. Um, here's another one. Money is the root of all evil. <laughs> now, it's close, right? What, what, what is it? it what's the, the actual verse is what? The love of money is the root of all evil. Not money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil, right? All right, here's another one. Heaven, let me give you the context here. So sometimes uh, we don't know what to say when people lose their loved ones. And we want to bring comforting phrases and comforting words. And I've heard people say this over and over and over. You probably have too. Heaven gained another angel. Well, no, that's not true because angels and human beings are two different created beings, okay? And so it might sound nice and it might feel like you're comforting somebody, but it's not in the Bible. Let me give you one more. Now, this next phrase is interesting because I had a Berean come up to me after the service and, and question me about this phrase, you say, well, what's a Brian? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. So you hang on. Um, God won't give you more than you can handle. And this Berean came up to me and said, I don't know if I agree that that's not found in 1 Corinthians. And I said, well, let's look at 1 Corinthians. So we did. Anyway, this, you know, we, so the idea of biblical literacy, do we know the Bible? Do we understand it? That's going to be part of what we're going to talk about this, this, this morning. Now, let me just say this. We're going to look at where the gospel goes to the, the city of Thessalonica. Then it's going to go to the city of Berea. And then it's going to go to Athens. Okay? So in chapter 17, if you want to turn there to Acts chapter 17, you're going to see the gospel is going to go to these three cities. Now, the first two cities, uh, the writer of Acts, Luke, is going to just give us kind of a quick overview. It's like five to seven verses, and he's just going to say, this happened here, okay? And then he's going to say, this happened in Thessalonica, and this happened in Berea. And then when we come to Athens, he's going to kind of go in, and he's going, we're going to see a lot more detail there. And Paul, we're going to hear what Paul actually said and how he interacted with the culture. So it's, real, it's, it's just a little different, okay? So that's what we're going to do. So if you would, turn to Acts chapter uh, 17. I'll start reading at verse 1. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis uh, and Apollonia, uh, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and, a, and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad fellows 
<laughs> they're knuckleheads. I mean, they found the, the, the lowlifes and they pulled in these bad characters, these bad people from the marketplace. They formed a mob and they started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order, uh, in, in order to bring them out to the crowd. So they were staying with Jace, this guy named Jason. And so they grabbed Jason and they put him in prison. And they basically said, Jason, you need to bring Paul and Silas to us. Well, Paul and Silas had fled the city. They were gone. So basically, uh, we leave the story and they release Jason and, uh, because Paul's no longer there. But they're not done with him yet. So that's, that's Thessalonica. And the lesson for us that we want to just talk about each, a lesson from each one of these and the lesson is this, that God calls us to plant the seeds of the gospel and allow him to give life. Now, how do we plant these seeds? Well, interestingly enough, um, Paul didn't manipulate. Paul didn't motivate by fear or guilt. That wasn't the way he did it. He didn't, it wasn't a one way, it was, it was a back and forth dialogue. In fact, when you see what he says, what it says here, it says, that he reasoned with them, explaining and proving. So there's a lot of dialogue. There's a lot of explaining. There's teaching with your head and, and, and understanding and asking questions and back and forth dialogue. Some of you have been in churches where there's been this dictatorial type of a uh, of a pontif pontificating uh, of authority or guilt. I remember years ago when I was a student and I went to one church, we were bused there. I won't mention the church in Anderson, Indiana. Um, anyway, um, Jack Hiles. Anyway, um, I remember that during the message, as he was preaching, a lady was sitting up front and she had a, a fussy child and uh, she, ban she, she got up to take the child out. And he said, sit down. No one leaves the service while I'm preaching. Yikes. I said to Carol, I said, we need to leave. <laughs> Problem is we came on a bus <laughs> and they're our only ride home. <laughs> that wasn't what Paul did. Paul was, Paul, Paul was explaining the gospel, and he understood the culture, and, and, he, and he was speaking to the culture. And we need to understand that we're here just to share where we found bread. Now, let me just stop for a minute, because one of the things we don't understand often is we think it all depends on me. No, it doesn't. Think about your own spiritual journey. There were probably many, many people involved in that journey, weren't there? There were maybe a book you read or a sermon you listened to or, or a, a person, a friend at work or at school or a neighbor, somebody that came up to you, somebody, they might have been there for a day for a conversation. It might have been there for a week or a couple of weeks or a month or a year or a couple of years. But you, maybe you were in their Bible study, but they, there were those touches, those moments that were significant in your life where you had a question that needed to be answered, where you, you had a, a, a just, you just needed a, a, a friend and they were there for you and, and maybe a loss in your life and they came and they, they loved you during your loss and they pointed you to Jesus. And when you think about it, that's what God does in our lives every day. God wants to use every one of us, whether we're in house here or whether you're watching online, God wants to use you to help take a person one step closer to Jesus. You might plant the seed. You might not even get the chance to plant the seed. Maybe all you're going to do is the ground is so hard that if we were to put a seed on it, it would bounce off of it. And your job is just to love a person and say, maybe you're the, they're the, you're the first Christian they've ever met that they can't just outhandedly reject Christianity because they met somebody that they like and they know that there's some, they have something that they desire. And so maybe you help break up that ground. Maybe you help, you help plant that seed. Maybe you help water that seed. Uh, but here's the point, and this is really important to understand. 
Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, he says, the Lord has assigned, has assigned each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who makes things grow. It's really important for us to understand that God is in control and God wants to use us, I don't understand why, to bring the gospel into other people's lives. Yeah, you don't need to take them from, the, from one step, all the, you know, 20 steps away across the line of faith. It may be just one step at a time. It may be just sharing an experience from your life. It may be just being there when they need help and loving them, and caring for them. But God wants to use you. And, and by the way, some of you have, have blown it with people. You've come across strong. You've come across arrogant. You, and I would just say to you, go and repent to that person. But, but the bottom line is, I want you to see that God is sovereignly working behind the scenes. And he wants to use you to bring people to Christ. And if you think about how you came to Christ, you realize he used a lot of people along the way. You may be one of those people. Let me give you one more thought. Some of you are praying for family members or friends in other cities and you're saying, God, please raise up Christians that can minister to my son, my daughter, my, my, my mom, my dad, my, my grandkids. You know, raise up a church, raise up people that would, would, would care about them, connect with them. Do you realize that some, some people are praying in other parts of the world and other parts of the country for Dubuque and the tri-state area and that you could be the answer? to their prayer. Now here's the thing. You have to understand in the midst of sowing the gospel, you need to expect rejection and persecution. Look at what he says in Thessalonians. And by the way, this, Paul writes now, he's writing about his experience that, he was, that we just read in the book of Acts. And he says, for you brothers and sisters became imitators of, of God's church, churches in Judea and our, and which are in Christ. You suffered from your own people the same things the churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They deplete, displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In other words, Paul says, there was a lot of conflict when we were there, that we were prevented from doing all that God wanted to do, but God still was able to plant a church, a good church in Thessalonica, in spite of it. Gospel goes to Berea. Look at verse 10. So, Paul and Silas flee. They go to Berea, the city of Berea, and it says this in verse 10, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away, away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were more noble in character than the, those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did a number of the prominent Greek women and Greek and many Greek men. So what's the lesson from Berea? Always check the teacher's work. <laughs> the Bereans listened to Paul, but they followed up by saying, is what he said true? Is it scriptural? Is it right? And this is where we want to spend just a little bit of time because we live in a culture where I would say that there are many churches where a pastor, a teacher, or even reading a book, or listening to a podcast or whatever, you could be listening to something that's totally heretical. And I believe there's a lot of people who would say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and you wouldn't catch it. You wouldn't catch it. Now, these Bereans, what they did is they heard what Paul said, and they said, is that true? Can I find that in Scripture? And one of the, one of the things that we hold in the Free Church of America, we're part of the Free Church, is where is it written? Where is it written? If it's not written in Scripture, then we say that's not scriptural. Now, not everything, you know, that we need to know is written in Scripture, but there are some things, like, let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean. So there was a Christian pastor 
who recently taught that we are not understanding John 3.16 correctly. We got it wrong. Now, if you don't know John 3.16, it's one of the most famous verses in the Bible. Besides Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and maybe Psalm 23, right, that you hear at funerals all the time. Uh, John 3.16 is one of the most famous verses of all time, right? What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting or eternal life, right? So that's John 3.16. He says, well, you got it wrong. And he taught the, what he said was the correct understanding. Well, the correct understanding was Jesus when he was here on earth, realized that he was God, that he had a godness about him. And just as Jesus discovered he had a godness, so we too should discover that we are God. And he takes the passage from the Old Testament where it's quoted, you are gods. And he says, and see, there's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that when we grasp our godness, we are really believing. And when we believe what Jesus says about grasping our own godness, that we we aren't in the image of God, but we are very God, that we are God, just as Jesus was God. When we do that, then we gain eternal life. Now, some of you are thinking, well, what's wrong with that? (laughs) I hope not. (laughs) It's just heresy from the pit of hell. (laughs) The sad thing about it is this is a Christian church, and many of the people were, they weren't saying amen because they didn't do that in this denomination, but they sat there nodding their heads. I would have just, I probably would have walked out. How, How does that happen? How does it happen that you take a clear verse and you make it up to mean whatever you want it to mean and people sit there and listen to it say, isn't our pastor clever? Uh Uh-huh. Clever is a word you could use. Let me give you another example. Like a week ago, Dr. Kevin Smith, who is a pastor in Jamaican city of Montego Bay, he told all of his followers to wear white robes I don't know if they did that on a regular basis, but they did it this night. He told them to put all their phones in tin foil, wrap them in tin foil, leave them at home, not bring their phones. And he told them they were going to go on a journey, a spiritual journey. So they gathered together, and one of the members, uh, they, had this, uh, they had them stand up front, and they had the members stand up, and one of the members slit the throat of another member, and they began to proceed to do that. Two of the members were murdered. It was a human sacrifice, but they, the idea was they were sending them ahead. It was the ark. They were leaving, and this is how they were going to leave. Thank God there was one woman who had a cell phone and called the police who came and stopped it, but before they were able to stop it, two people were dead. Uh, and the interesting thing, there was at least one or two police officers that were part of the congregation who were participating in this ritual human sacrifice under the banner of a Christian church. Happened a week ago. Hey, how is that possible? How in the world is that possible? How do people sit there and just listen to this and say, yeah, that sounds right to me. Let me give you one more. In a recent survey, I don't know if it was Barna or who, Pew Research, I don't know who it was, 70% of people who would identify as born-again Christians, 70% of people who identify as born-again Christians said They disagreed with the statement that Jesus is the only way to God, to heaven. Let me say that one more time so you hear what I'm saying. 70% of born-again Christians rejected the idea that Jesus is the only way to God. 70% of those who claim to be born again. We're not talking about people who use the word Christian. These are people who claim to be born again. 70% said I disagree that Jesus is the only way to God. 
Even though in John 14, 6, Jesus says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It really couldn't be much clearer than that. How in the world do 70% of people who profess to be born-again Christians reject John 14, 6? I don't know. I would hope that if I were to say something like that, many of you would say, and I can usually greet people over here, I hope many of you would walk over and say, um, yeah, yeah, what? What? So let me ask you a question. What are you doing to build your Berean muscle? It says says in in Acts, the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians. They didn't didn't dismiss Paul, but they, 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 they listened to what Paul taught, and then they checked it out, and they said, is that jive with what we've heard? Let me ask you a question. Are you doing any daily devotional reading? Are you reading the Bible on a daily basis? I was going to ask you, when was the last time you read your Bible? I won't ask you to raise your hands. Are you reading through the Bible? Do you have any plan to read through the Bible? Are you listening to... Listen, if you're lazy, I understand that. I'm lazy too, but you can just type in two words in Google, audio Bible, just do that, and it will come up to a site, it will have the NIV, or you can pick whatever translation you want, and you can pick whatever book you want, and you can hit play, and you can listen to it, and they read it for you. You can't even claim anymore that I don't understand the old King James, or I'm not a very good reader. You could do it on your phone. Every one of you has, I'm assuming you have a phone, and you can read it or you can listen to it while you're getting ready in the morning, while you're driving to work. You can do that. Are you doing any inductive Bible study? Are you memorizing Scripture? You know, of course, I, you expect me to memorize Scripture, and I do, but... Do you memorize scripture? Do you know what John 3.16 is? Do you know John 1, uh, you know, 14.6? Do you know that verse? Do you know some of the other verses? Are you treasuring or hiding God's word in your heart? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not what? Sin against you. <laughs> All right. Now the gospel goes to Athens. This is where we kind of focus in. Don't have time to really spend a lot of time there, but go to verse 22. So basically, Paul gets up there, and he starts to share, and they're all hotty toddy They're like philosophers, and they're very educated, and this is like one of those you know, really you know, culturally leading cities. They set the culture. And so Paul comes in, little ratty Paul, and he starts spouting off these ideas, and they go, what is this babbler babbling on about? Paul, go in verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus, uh, Ariakabus is just a, a hill where they would exchange ideas, have, maybe have a market uh, there. They'd have uh, debates. They'd have discussions. They do the Socratic method of asking questions to learn knowledge. Um, it was also called by the Romans, this hill was called Mars Hill. So it's interesting because we have two places in Acts where you have Bereans. Some of you have maybe been part of a Berean church, Berean Baptist or Berean Bible. And you say, well, where does that come from? Well, it comes from that chapter. And then you hear of Mars Hill, right? Not the Mars Hill that's in trouble right now that you hear, but Mars Hill was the Roman name for this hill. So Paul is on Mars Hill, and he says this, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, For as I walked around looking carefully at the objects of worship, I found an altar with with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now, what's going on here is, as you know, in Greece in that day, they had the God of, you know, thunder, Thor. They had all these different gods. And um, 
basically they, you know, there was tradition that you know, if the God visited and was, was offended or upset, they, you were in big trouble. And we kind of ran into that earlier in Acts and we don't have time to talk about it. But, but they're at a place where they're going, they're thinking smart. They're going, okay, so there may be a God that we don't know their name. Let's make an altar to them. So if they come and visit, we'll say, oh yeah, we just didn't know your name. We, here, we'll inscribe it right now. We've got an altar ready for you. And so there was a fear of the gods. There was this, you know, this, and the gods were, you know, they were angry and they were, you, you had to please them and appease them. And it, it, there was just all of that. So they have this altar so they don't tick off one of the many gods, right? And he says, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives life and breath to everything, uh, everything else. Now, let me just stop there. So Paul is saying something radically different than what they believed in Athens. They believed that they had to appease the gods and that there were many gods. And Paul says, there's only one God and this God doesn't need temples and he doesn't need you to bow down to him and worship him. And you know, some of the uh, you know, liberal people would say or atheistic or agnostic people would say, well, you know, it's too bad that your God is so weak that he has to be worshiped. Our God doesn't have to be worshiped, but we find our purpose and we find our meaning when we worship somebody greater than us. And basically, Paul says, there is one who is greater that doesn't need temples, who doesn't need to be served, but has revealed himself. He's not unknown, he is known. He has revealed himself to you. And then he says this, notice what he says. Uh, he's not served by human hands. He doesn't need you to serve him as if he needed anything. Rather, he is the one, he himself gives life uh, and breath and everything else for by for let me just stop for a minute did you wake up today and acknowledge God the reason you're you're breathing right now the reason you have a pulse today the reason that you're alive today is because God has given you that life it is a gift we don't deserve another day we don't deserve another breath. We don't deserve another beat of our heart. It is gifted to us by God. That's Paul's argument here. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and boundaries uh, of their land. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. And then notice what he says here. For in him, we live and move and have our being. And frankly, I think there's a lot of Christians that don't understand that in a practical way in their daily lives that the very life you're living, the very energy, the very breath the, is, is gifted to you by God. God did this so that they would seek him. And then he goes on, he says, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So they, they call Paul a babbler. What is this babbler saying? What is he talking about? And so the two philosophies of, of Athens, the two major philosophies, and you say, Pastor, why are we talking about these old philosophies? Because they're very relevant for us today. One was Stoicism. Do you know what Stoicism was? Stoicism basically said, live a good, moral, decent life, keep a stiff upper lip, um, don't let life master you, you master it. And this is a virtue that people hold today. You, I see a lot of guys with this virtue. They think life is hard, my marriage is not great, my job's not going well, and I am not going to share anything with anyone. I am going to keep a stiff upper lip. I'm going to endure it. I'm going to make it because that's what a man does. And he comes home and his wife says, H how are you? How did it go today? Fine. Are you really? Yes. Do you want to talk about it? No. 
They self-medicate with alcohol or drugs. They don't talk. They feel like it's a weakness to say, hey, I'm struggling. Hey, I'm having a hard time. Hey, I need somebody to talk to. They don't have friends that can share because that scene is kind of like, really? That's stoicism. That's alive today just like it was back then. And it's destructive. It's unhealthy. It's not healthy to hold it in. It's not healthy to not have other people. And the question is, if you're a guy here today and you don't have somebody that you can open and share your life with, when are you going to find that help? Because you need it. And you know what? It's not masculine to do that. It's stupid. It just is. I'm sorry. It just is. But the other one is the Epicureans. The Epicureans were, they basically said, live and let live. When you, you, you live, you die, and you're done. So eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. So live your life and be happy. And go for the gusto and do what makes you happy. Do you. Yes, you might hurt other people. It's not your intent to do it. But if you do, you do. Move on, because life is short, and you deserve to be happy, even if it means your family's not happy and other people around you aren't happy, as long as you're happy. That's not relevant to today, is it? People aren't living that way today, are they? (laughs) And in the midst of these cultural beliefs, Paul says something very different and very dramatic. He says, purpose in life comes when you do two things that our culture, and our culture still says that today. Two things that our culture says is foolishness. Number one, love God. Our culture says there is no God. Or God is whatever I construct him to be. And Paul says, no, he's not. And God is the one who gives life. God is the one, God is the reason why you're able to even have an argument about against him. God is the one who gives you life and gives you breath. And, and God is the one who holds your life in his very hands, the ones who created the heavens and the earth. And, and, and so it makes sense that we worship our creator because he's the one who created us. And, and basically he says purpose and meaning comes when you say, God, you are God. And I've come to worship you and acknowledge that I'm not God and you're bigger than me. The second purpose of life is to love others. By the way, do you know that if you're, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, one thing you ought to know is the two major things that you, that are just non-negotiable, you should know these, is the two things in life that your life should be about. Every day when you wake up are two things, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Our culture says what? Look out for number one. Enjoy your life while you have it. Live for yourself. Do you. It goes totally counter to The gospel goes totally counter to our culture. But here's the last thing I want to show you. Not only does purpose come from the living God, from loving God and loving others, but Paul basically says, you know this statue that you have of an unknown God? Let me tell you about this unknown God. This unknown God can be known. In fact, he's revealed himself. And and let me give you three ways that God has revealed himself. Number one, God reveals himself through nature. You see the fall, and it's it's nice in Iowa, but you know, you go to western New York, and it's unbelievable. You go to the east coast, and it's uh, it's unbelievable. Maine and New Hampshire, when you see the fall there, you've seen the fall. You see the trees, It's, it's incredible, the mountains and all that. You see the spring. You see the mountains, you see the snow, you see the, the, the beauty of the planet. And basically, God has revealed himself, Paul says in Romans, God has revealed himself through nature. You, you look at a, a, a wall and you see a painting, you say there's an artist behind it. You look at nature, you look at the beauty of nature and the awesomeness of nature and you say there's an artist, there's a God behind it. And, and, that, and that's how God reveals himself through nature. But not only that, God doesn't just reveal himself externally. He reveals himself internally. Because it says, that, and Paul says this, he says, God has given us a conscience. God has given us a knowledge of good and evil in a sense where 
We have the ability, and, and I know this is true, even if you were raised in a home that said stealing and lying and, and deceit was, was a good thing, uh, you knew in your heart that it wasn't. There was something within you, deep within you, that said this is wrong. And some of you were raised in homes where your parents told you or are teaching you right now to do things or believe things that are wrong. And in your heart, you don't want to show dishonor to your parents, but you know in your heart it's wrong. Where did that come from? It came from God. Because God has given us, given us a conscience. But more importantly than that, we celebrate Christmas, which means God came from heaven to earth and revealed himself to us. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says, I'm not gonna speak my words. The words I speak are the words the Father gives to me. You're hearing God. God has revealed himself to me and I'm revealing him to you. And so, so basically Paul says, you don't have to build an altar to all these gods. There's only one God who's over all things. And he doesn't need to be worshipped. And he doesn't need temples. But he has graciously revealed himself to you. And he reveals himself through nature, through the conscience, many other ways. But also through Jesus Christ. The Hebrew says, in these last days, he's revealed himself through his son. So my question is, do you know him? Has there been a moment in your life where you've called upon the Lord? The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He gave his life for you on the cross. Have you ever given your life to him? Have you begun a relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you understood you're a sinner and you need a savior? And you say, Jesus, you're my only hope. And you say, Jesus, like the thief on the cross, Jesus, remember me when you get into paradise. And he, Jesus says, well, today you'll be with me. And it was just faith. Will you trust him? And you say, I don't know if I have enough faith. Just take that first step. And then the next step will come. Just take that first step. Take that step and say, Jesus, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're going to lead me, but you gave your life to me. Now, I, as a sinner, forgiven by you, give my life to you and see what he does. You'll look back in five or ten years and you go, wow, it's amazing. Three different churches. Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens. The gospel hits these three cities and changes the lives of the people forever, for eternity. And we're reading about it today. The question is, what influence, what impact will the gospel have on our lives today? Stand with me, let's pray. Father, help us to be good Bereans that when we hear false teaching, we're uh, able to detect it. That means we have to be part of a plan where we're reading and, and hearing and uh, involved in your word. Help us to um, just to be good Bereans, but also help us, Father, to be aware of those around us, the opportunities you give to us, those good Samaritans, those divine appointments where we can help a person take one step closer to Jesus. Um, help us to be that person, your arms and your feet for that. Because okay, you're gonna give us those opportunities this week and I pray that the Spirit of God would wake us up at those moments, those key significant moments and say, here it is, here it is, do something. And Father, prepare us for those moments this, today and this week. For we need your help. For those who may be prayed to receive Christ, I pray that you would encourage them to tell somebody else that they're taking that step of faith and they need help with the other steps. I pray for the stoic men that they would see that it's not manly to hold it in. They should find friends they can talk with and just share with and release some of the angst, the frustration and the fear and the anger and the, all those different things that come out as emotions of anger. We need you, Father. And uh, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. And we worship you now. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.